We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? But I want to start by asking you to think through a question to keep in mind as we work through our passage here today. And the question is this, if you had the opportunity to introduce Jesus for the very first time to the world, what would you say? How would you do it? The Bible gives him a ton of designations. He's called the Word. He's called the Son of Man. He's called the Son of God. He is called the Lord. He's called the truth. He's called the life. Which ones would you choose to introduce Jesus Christ? Well, I want you to keep that question in mind as we move through this passage, but we're going we're gonna to come back to that question later on. But here in the passage that we're going to look at today, there was a man who got such an opportunity. If you have your Bible, open with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Now, the narrative portion of John's Gospel begins uh, with John the Baptist. And John the Apostle, the writer, records for his readers three successive days in which John the Baptist was bearing witness to the person of Christ. He was fulfilling his ministry. He was preparing the way for the coming Lord. And on day two, John was testifying to the crowds at large as Jesus steps onto the scene for the very first time. Now, this is the moment where in Jesus' public ministry that, that begins, where he is introduced to the world for the very first time. And so we're going to focus in on one verse today. The opening words from John the Baptist as Jesus appears on the scene in verse 29. Read with me if you would. It says, The next day he, being John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now these are obviously very familiar words to anyone who cares about the Bible And they ought to be. This is a significant moment in redemptive history. When speaking on this verse in particular, the great Bishop J.C. Ryle once said, this verse ought to be printed in great letters in the memory of every reader of the Bible. Never was there a fuller testimony born to Christ upon earth than that which is here born by John the Baptist. And that is absolutely true. But in this passage, John introduces Jesus in a way that nobody expected at the time. And to be honest, I wonder if we as believers, as the church, even though this is one of the most familiar and treasured verses, I often wonder if we understand the implications of what is said here. So today we're going to break this down by looking at both the meaning and the significance of John's great announcement. And what I'm going to argue from this passage is that this opening introduction is not only instructive for our understanding of who Christ is and why he came, but it's also instructive for us as his followers. If we as believers want to live lives of faithfulness in the very brief time that God has given us, then we must be prepared to follow the example of the Lamb of God wherever that may lead. And there is much to learn here embedded in John's opening announcement. So let's look at this text and let's start working through this scene. Read this passage with me one more time, John 1.29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
So up to this point, John's ministry has been going on for months and months. He was attracting crowds uh, likely beyond what you have ever imagined. So much so that all three of the synoptics talk about the magnitude of the crowds. Uh, The book of Mark says it in this way. It says, all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by John in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. There was no one at the time who had not heard of John the Baptist. Even the secular first century historian Josephus wrote about John, and he said that his influence was so great that even the king feared John because the crowds seemed ready to do anything that he advised. So John John was no small thing. He was not just a spectacle that people were going out to gawk at. He was someone everyone was listening to. He was someone everyone was taking seriously. His following was massive. And he had been baptizing and preparing everyone for the coming one. He had been been preparing them for this moment when the Son of God steps onto the scene and is revealed before the crowd. Now, mind you, as you are picturing this scene of Christ walking forward in your mind's eye, you ought not to be thinking about a man in a clean white robe or a golden sash or a halo or honestly anything that would make him stand out as unusual. Uh, This was, by all appearances, a typical Middle Eastern Jew of the working class. In fact, when Isaiah prophesied about him in Isaiah 53, he said he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. So all these portrayals and and pictures and movies in Hollywood of this super attractive, winsome looking guy that stood out from everyone else, it's just not biblical, not at all. This was, by all appearances, a typical working class Middle Eastern Jew that was walking towards John the Baptist, which makes everything that he is about to say all the more shocking as he introduces him to the world. But what he says right out of the gate would have thrown people for a loop. He says, behold, meaning look, he's he's pointing him out. He's getting everyone's attention at this man who is walking towards him. He says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The very first words that John chooses to introduce the Messiah, to introduce the Christ at the start of his ministry, are the Lamb of God. Now, for us as, as believers, uh, these words are precious, right? I mean, we, we love this truth. We love the implication of this epithet. But believe it or not, there's actually quite a bit of conversation and scholarship about exactly what John meant here. There are several Old Testament references that could be in mind, and even some New Testament ideas that might be being foreshadowed. But the one idea that we can pretty much universally reject out of the gate was that John was using this designation just merely to emphasize that Jesus is meek and mild and gentle in character. Uh, Certainly he is. He says that in Matthew 11. He says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. That is absolutely true. That is part of his character. But that's not the idea that is in mind in this passage. There's more going on here than that. So why did he call Jesus the Lamb of God? Was this an allusion to the provided Lamb of Genesis 22? Was this an allusion to the Passover lamb of Exodus 12? Was this an allusion to the daily sacrificed lamb prescribed in Exodus 29? Was this an allusion to the lamb led to the slaughter in Isaiah 53? Or was this an allusion to the future triumphant lamb of Revelation chapter 5, written about by the same author? Those are usually the ideas that are thrown on the table and debated. Well, I'm going to argue that the answer to this question is yes. Yes to all of those. Now, certainly some are going to say, wait, John had to have a certain lamb in mind when he made this declaration. He was tying this to something. But the fact is, John the Baptist was a prophet. And just like the prophets of old who were carried along by the Holy Spirit, oftentimes they spoke better than they knew. Oftentimes there was more meaning in the words of the prophets than even the prophets understood. We see this quite clearly in 1 Peter chapter 1 and even in John chapter 11. 
Now, the truth is, is we look into the history of redemption, the Bible has been developing a narrative about the role of the Lamb in the redemptive work of God, all of which finds its fulfillment in Christ. In Genesis 22, God told Abraham to take his only son. Well, what about Ishmael? No, take your only son whom you love and sacrifice him. On the way up the mountain, Isaac asked his father, Father, where, where's the lamb? Abraham replied, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. We all know the story. At the last minute, the angel shows up when Isaac is laid on the altar and he stays the hand of Abraham and there is a ram provided, caught in the thicket. And John the Apostle ties these stories together in John chapter 3 when he says that God sent his only son, his beloved son, alluding to Genesis 22. So Christ is the lamb of Genesis 22. Well, what about the Passover lamb of Exodus 12? Passover lamb of Exodus 12 was the lamb that God had commanded for every Israelite to take for their household. They were to take a lamb without blemish or spot, and on the day of preparation for the Passover, they were to kill the lamb and apply its blood to the doorpost. And they were to eat its flesh. And when the wrath of God came, when the judgment of God came, God said, any house that I see with the blood of the lamb on its doorpost, he would pass over it with his judgment. And again, John the Apostle ties this directly to Christ. In chapter 19, verse 31, he notates that it was on the day of preparation that they killed Christ. And in order to expedite the death of Christ and the other two on the crosses, the soldiers were actually ordered to break their legs. And they carried that out with the two criminals. But when they came to Christ, they had discovered that he was already dead. So instead, of course, they pierced his side just to ensure. And then John says something in verse 36 of chapter 19. It's very peculiar. He says, These things took place that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. What scripture is that? That comes from Exodus chapter 12. God's instructions to the Israelites concerning the Passover lamb, he said, it shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of its flesh outside the house and you shall not break any of its bones. It was pointing to Christ all along. So Jesus is clearly the lamb of Genesis 22. He's clearly the lamb of Exodus 12. Well, what about the daily sacrificial lamb of Exodus 29? In Exodus 29, God prescribed that every day at the temple, at the door of the tent of the meeting, where God met with his people, every single day when the sun rose, a one-year-old lamb would be sacrificed as the first sacrifice of the day, as an offering to the Lord. Every other sacrifice and offering would come after that. And every day at twilight, as the last sacrifice to the Lord, a one-year-old lamb would be sacrificed as a pleasing aroma to God. The sacrificial lamb bookended every single sacrifice. Every day the Jews began and ended their day sacrificing a lamb to God. And that was still going on at this time at the temple when John the Baptist's ministry is running every day. And the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that the daily sacrifice finds its fulfillment in Christ. Hebrews 10, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, John the Apostle doesn't explicitly tie, these connection, tie this together in his gospel, but you can be assured that the crowd who John the Baptist was addressing, the crowd who had seen and smelled and heard every day the daily sacrifice of the lamb would make this connection. A lamb in their mind would automatically bring up a sacrifice. But then there's the explicit messianic prophecy of Isaiah 53, one we're all familiar with. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. When we get to the passion narrative in the gospel of John and all of the gospels for that matter, You see that those words are lived out as Christ is led around like a lamb led to the slaughter and he stays silent before his accusers. Well, finally, with the writer being the Apostle John, it certainly brings brings to mind for Christian readers the culmination of this entire biblical theme in the apocalyptic vision of Revelation chapter 5, where John sees the triumphant Messiah and he says, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And then he reports that myriads upon myriads and thousands upon thousands were all gathered there to worship the Son, saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. The land theme of Scripture literally runs from Genesis to Revelation. Now, of those, is there just one that we can tie this to? What did John the Baptist have in mind? And the reality is we don't know what John the Baptist had in mind. But we do know that he was a prophet who spoke by the Holy Spirit. And I think because that is true, we can say in a very real way that all of these passages are intended and behind this designation for Christ as the Lamb of God. He fulfills them all. But there is one common thread that every one of those biblical reference includes. One concept that we know for a fact that John intended and would have been understood by those who heard it. And that is the idea of sacrifice. Every single one of those passages speaks of a sacrificial lamb. And in the mind of a first century Jew, a lamb, a lamb of God, is a sacrificial lamb. But this was not just any lamb. This was not just a lamb. This was the lamb. This was the lamb par excellence. And we know that that was, the reason we know that's intended by John is what he says immediately after. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was an atoning sacrifice. This was a sacrifice for sin. This was atonement language coming from the sacrificial system. You know, there there are those who try to pit Paul against Jesus or try to pit the epistles against the Gospels. And one of the things that they will say is that substitutionary atonement was in Paul, but it was not in the Gospels. And that is just utter nonsense. That's just utterly not true. Here it is, right here, at the very beginning, he came to be an atonement for sins, to pay the penalty for sin. Matthew says something similar in the opening of his gospel. Matthew 1.21, he came to save his people from their sins. But John makes it clear that his people are not just the people of one nation, but it is the entire world. That is all people without distinction, not just the Jews. He was an atoning sacrifice for his people from every nation. As the same writer, writer John will say in Revelation 5, by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He is the Savior for the world. And that is the meaning here. He is a sacrificial lamb for the world. John's great declaration is that the Messiah, the divine Son, has come as the Lamb of God to atone for sin. Now, as we think about and we move to the significance of this, there are two very jarring statements that everyone heard, that everyone could have understood, but that nobody really processed. And I'm going to start with the second one. And that is that this Messiah is for the whole World, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is making a declaration that this Messiah is not just for one nation, but for all nations. Now that's not a shocking statement to us, for sure. Of course Jesus is for the whole world, right? Unless you're a pure blood Jew in this room, we are all products of the truth that Jesus is for the whole world. But for the Jew in the first century, this almost didn't even make sense. Here you have a Jewish prophet 
speaking to a Jewish nation about their Jewish Messiah, and he says he takes away the sin of the world. This was a stumbling block, not only for the Jews of the first century, but even for some of the early Christians, even for the apostles. If you remember, when God comes to Peter in Acts chapter 10 to send him to Cornelius' home, Peter argues with God three times. He argues with God. That's how ingrained this way of thinking was in Peter's mind. When Peter finally does go to Cornelius' home, He starts his time there by shedding light on his hesitation. He says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone from another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. It was unlawful for a Jew to associate or even to visit with anyone from another nation. See, the Jews were about the Jews, That's the reality. And many times they hated the other nations. There existed a dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. But the Jews had missed the heart of God on this one. Because while, yes, Israel was the chosen nation, God's plan had always been for His mercy to extend to the nations. And there are evidence of this all through the Old Testament, going all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. It started with Father Abraham. God told him, through your offspring, all the nations shall be blessed. That was always God's intention. You know, one of the clearest places that we see God's heart and Jewish attitude towards the nations is with the story of Jonah. You know, Jonah was a prophet of God. God sent Jonah to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, to call them to repentance. And instead of going, Jonah ran. Why? Because he hated the Assyrians. Now, before we judge Jonah too harshly, you need to know that the Assyrians were a particularly evil people. God himself called Nineveh the city of blood. And historical records have shown that they not only conquered their surrounding nations, but they boasted in their torture of the people that they had captured. Cruelties were going on there that I would not even feel comfortable describing in this context. It's not an exaggeration to say that when you think of Nineveh, you need to think of something akin to Nazi Germany. It was that bad. And yet God sends a prophet to call them to repentance. And we all know how the story goes. Jonah runs from that call. God chases him down through various circumstances, including getting swallowed up by a fish. Eventually, Jonah answers the call, and he does go to Nineveh. He proclaims their pending doom, and Nineveh responds exactly the way Jonah was afraid they would. They repented. In sackcloth and ash, they cried out for God's mercy, and God relented of his coming judgment. And Jonah was furious because he wanted God to judge them. He didn't want God to have mercy upon them. And so Jonah goes out into the desert and he pouts. And to teach Jonah a lesson, God caused a plant to grow up over Jonah's head to provide him with some shade. The sun was scorching at that time. And Jonah loved the plant. But then God caused it to die. And Jonah was again angry because of the loss of the plant. And then God said this to him at the very close of the book. He said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? God's heart towards the lost towards pagan nations, even in the Old Testament, was one of pity. Yes, he judged, but he was one who had always had been and always will be slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's who he is. 
That's his character. And that is why Jesus came, because God loves the world. Jesus came not just to take the sin of away of one nation, but of the world. As John will say later in chapter 11, to gather in the children of God who are scattered abroad among the nations and to make them one. And this declaration that John is making was a shock. And the people didn't even process it. But this should also serve a warning to us. Not to forget God's heart towards the world, towards the lost. The gospel did not begin and end with us. And in these evil times in which we live, I believe the temptation to become like Jonah is very real. To look down our noses at the lost. The temptation to desire God's judgment of the lost more than God's God's mercy of the lost. The truth is, judgment is coming. You can bank on it. And when it comes, God will execute his justice and he will vindicate his name and we will all praise him for that. But in the meantime, we are not to just sit back and wait for his judgment. We are to be the church militant. We are to be advancing his kingdom. And we do that not by fighting with the world for seats of power. Jesus is already seated at the right hand of power. No, we do that by advancing a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We do that by announcing that a Savior has come for the world, that there is a gospel of grace to be had. Yes, this world is full of evil and wicked people who do not know their right hand from their left. If any time that was true, it's our time. But lest we forget, if not for the grace of God, there go I. The same message that transformed us is the same message that we are to take to a lost and dying world around us. And as we do that, we are following in the example of our Lord who came for this lost and dying world. But there is another example here that we need to be mindful of, which is the other jarring aspects of, of John's announcement. When John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, it was jarring not only because of the aspect of the world, but also because he was saying, in essence, that their Messiah would be sacrificed, that he came to die, that he came to be slaughtered like a lamb. And this was made clear to the crowds. This was made clear to the disciples from the very get-go, from the very beginning. But as the narrative moves on, you see that nobody really believed that to be true. Nobody really understood or processed the significance of that statement. Why? Because there are presupposed expectations about the Messiah. They were expecting a conquering king not a suffering servant. They did not have a category for a Messiah being put to death. They believed he was coming to break the rule and the oppression that was upon the Jews and to overthrow the government and to establish his rule on earth. As Isaiah said, the government would be upon his shoulders. And they were right to believe that in a sense. Jesus is coming back one day for that purpose. He will clean house. But before that could happen... What they did not understand, in order for God to reconcile guilty sinners to himself, he had to redeem his people. He had to come as the suffering servant, as the Lamb of God. And that was a stumbling block to Jews. They wanted victory now through physical conquest. But rather, they got an announcement of the Lamb. But don't think that just because Jesus came as the Lamb that he came in defeat. You see, I think it's not just the Jews who struggle with this concept, but sometimes it's even the church. And I dare say that most of us, if we had the opportunity that John the Baptist had here to introduce Jesus for the very first time in his ministry, we probably would have chosen a different introduction. Behold, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Behold, the judge of all the earth. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We would communicate something of might, something of strength, something of power, something of victory. But John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb. But in the, tr- the truth is, in the ironic processes of God, this was the greatest announcement of victory and strength that could ever be made. It was the lamb led to the slaughter that would achieve the greatest victory this world has ever known. 
In God's paradoxical plan, victory comes through suffering. The cross was not a place of defeat. It was actually the central place of the greatest victory that will ever be told. Jesus came to defeat the works of the devil, and he did that on the cross. Colossians says it was through the cross that he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and the powers, and he triumphed over them. And it was through the cross that he redeemed his people. The cross is the wisdom of God. This is why when John the Apostle, the writer, is given a vision of the triumphant Messiah, he does not see a vision of a lion. He sees a vision of a lamb standing as though he had been slain. John the Baptist's announcement of the Lamb of God was an announcement of victory. But it was victory through suffering. And part of the stumbling block was not just that the Messiah himself came to suffer, but that he came to chart a course for his followers. On the path to Calvary, on the path, the road of suffering, it was then that Jesus issued the call to follow me. Jesus said in Matthew 16, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You see, for the Messiah, the path to victory, the path to glory was through suffering. But somehow many in the church think that that path was great for Jesus, but not for us. The church triumphant is going to have a different path. No, no, it's the same path. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Philippians 1, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Romans 8, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you into his eternal glory will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5. But wait a minute, doesn't the Bible tell us that we are more than conquerors now? Yes, it does. But listen to the context of that. Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are conquerors by virtue of our union with Christ. And nothing we go through in this life can change that. But we are called to share in the sufferings of Christ. That is the path to glory. That is the path to victory. In fact, that's the point, the entire point of the entire book of Revelation, to follow the triumphant Lamb's example. G.K. Beale said it perfectly. He said, the main rhetorical goal of the literary argument of John's apocalypse is to exhort God's people to remain faithful to the call to follow the Lamb's paradoxical example, victory through suffering, and not to compromise all with the goal of inheriting final salvation. Brothers and sisters, our great victor is the Lamb. We are to follow Him. So Christian, in whatever God has called you to do, when you face suffering in this life, and you will, do not think it's strange. Do not think that God has turned His back on you. It is the path that God has ordained for you. It is the same path that Christ took to victory, and it is the path that leads to glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son to be a sacrifice for sin. Thank you for the lamb and his example to us. God, may we all be faithful in this brief time we have called life to follow his example, to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world, and to suffer faithfully as unto you with our eyes fixed upon Christ and the glory that lays before us. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.